Right, so this is Dr. HWD. We are going to start surgery and I plan on ending surgery in this one session, right? Like today, maybe we'll do two sessions, but we want to make sure that we end it today. There are just 300 questions. And when I say just, I mean, you know, it's going to be easy. Inshallah, you'll be able to answer them. Uh, not much of science is involved here. I mean, you know, you've done these questions already in the previous uh, portions, right? You've done some of them in cardiology, you've done some of them in medicine, in pediatrics, in gynecology. I know it's a different subject, but you're definitely going to do it. I know this. All right, so let's just start. Okay, can you guys see the screen and hear me properly? Can everybody see the screen and hear me properly? Okay, good. Right. So, you know, the drill, you have to read the question. This one says, what's the single most appropriate next best step in the management, right? What's the next best step in the management? So this person, he, CT is normal. She's 33 year old. She's been complaining of vomiting, severe occipital headache, conscious and alert with photophobia. What do you want to do next? What do you want to do next? She's got photophobia, severe occipital headache. She's 33 year old. CD scan is normal. What do you want to do next? First of all, what's the diagnosis? Secondly, what do you want to do next? First, you need to see what's the diagnosis. She had a severe occipital headache. What does that signify? Having a severe occipital headache, what does that? Meningitis, does she have a fever? Does she have a fever? For meningitis, you're supposed to have a fever, no? She doesn't have a fever. It's acute onset, complaining of vomiting, an acute onset fever. You understand what happened here? This is your subarachnoid hemorrhage. And sometimes in subarachnoid hemorrhage, we see xanthochromia if we, you know, check the CSF within 12 hours. Right, guys? You know what a subarachnoid hemorrhage looks like on the CT scan? What does it look like? Can you describe it for me? Can you describe it for me? Expanded banana or selfish lemon? No, no, no. What does it look like on the on the CT scan? What does it look like on the CT scan? Yellow? Yellow, what yellow? What's the shape of it? On the CT, I'm not saying CSF, I'm saying CT. I'm saying CT. It's like a banana, right? Like it's like an expanded banana, right? Is that subdural hemorrhage or subarachnoid hemorrhage? Because you know, I'm here to confuse you and make sure that you guys remember things. And that would only happen if I confuse you. Blood and sulci. Okay, all right, all right, okay, let's. I'm hoping you guys are right, because you know, this is something that we've done already. So I don't think I'll be discussing on it. We've done this in emergency. We've done this in med, uh, med, uh, your cardiology. Right, your neurology. So I'm not going to discuss this because this is already done. Next question. What's the most likely diagnosis? Ball sounds required. There is rebound tenderness. Garden in the upper right quadrant. A temperature of 38.7. Right? She's got icteric sclera. This, no, no, no. This is a 55-year-old. He's got acute abdominal pain. Feeling unwell. Right? And they have got uh, sclera, which are icteric. He broke a finger uh, one week ago. He's got a history of gallstones. What's the diagnosis? He's got rebound tenderness, a temperature, right? Acute abdominal pain. What's the diagnosis? What is the diagnosis? What is Charcot's triangle? Triad, sorry. What's Charcot's triad? What's Charcot's triad? What is Charcot's triad? What is charcoal strike? John disc right upper quadrant pain and do you guys know what's charcoal strike? What else? John disc right upper quadrant pain and fever. And that is positive in where do we see that? Is it cholecystitis? Is it acute cholecystitis? Okay, it's acute cholecystitis. You guys are saying it's three. Let's see if that's true. That is incorrect, right, guys? I I did mention Charcot's triad, and I did talk about you know right of cotton pain. This patient has right of cotton pain. He's got fever. He's got jaundice, 
right? What, what, what is different in acute cholecystitis that we don't see here? Can anybody appreciate that? What happens in acute cholecystitis that we don't see here? Typically, a female would come in, right? Typically, a female would come in, right? And what else would be there? Systemic symptoms are more pronounced, right? Systemic symptoms are more pronounced. This person just has abdominal pain, feeling unwell because of the pain. He doesn't have any vomiting. He doesn't have any more of the systemic symptoms, right? And chocolate stride is very, very important here, where there's right up quadrant pain, jaundice and fever. Please don't forget that. Do you guys understand what I'm saying? Everybody following me, Dr. Berman, Dr. Butchin, Dr. Safana, Dr. Hasma. Do you guys understand what's happening? Can anybody hear me? Or should I be singing some songs so that you would start hearing me? Everybody following me, Dr. Nene, Dr. Samir, Dr. Sheila, Dr. Nagma. Okay, so please don't forget this, right? Don't forget this. You know, the thing is that if you were thinking acute cholecystitis, you would think of a female, first of all. Don't worry, Dr. Samir, you just joined and we've just started. Okay, next question. Next question, all right. Um, what's the most likely diagnosis? Nurse indicates that she has not opened her ball since surgery. Four days ago, uh, she had a right uh, hemicolectomy, right hemicolectomy for colon cancer. 67 years old, she develops vomiting and distended abdomen, no ball sounds. She had hemicolectomy when? Four days ago. What's the diagnosis? What's the diagnosis? Okay, how do you differentiate between paralytic ileus and uh, anastomotic leakage? How do you differentiate between paralytic ileus and anastomotic leakage, ball sounds, all right? So, so in anastomotic leakage, you could hear the ball sounds? Is that what you're saying? What is the day of presentation if it was an anastomotic leakage? At what day the person would typically present? Five to 10 days, typically 10 days, right? So this person's got a fever. Does she have a fever? Is she having a fever? Is she having a fever? Her temperature is 36.9. Is she having a fever? You guys say peritonitis, right? Somebody said peritonitis. I guess Dr. Berman said peritonitis. For you to say peritonitis, she should definitely have some fever, right? She should be, you know, what else would you see in peritonitis? No fever, right? No fever. This is paralytic ileus, right? This is paralytic ileus according to what you guys are saying. I'm not saying it, right? You guys have said it. Let's see if that's true. Okay, let's see if that's true. Post-operative, and then she's got um, tenderness, right? And no ball sound. See, the raised CRP is normal, right? Normal after surgery, right? The trigger here is surgery. What else would you see in paralytic ileus? Absent ball sounds. What else do you see metabolically? What else do you see metabolically in a paralytic ileus? What else do you see metabolically in paralytic ileus? Metabolically, what happens to the anions or the cations of the body? WBC not raised. Hyperkalemia, hypokalemia. Hypo or hyperkalemia in paralytic ileus? Hypokalemia. Where else do you see hypokalemia in children, uh, in, 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 in your projectile vomiting when they have an olive mass thing? What, what happens there? What's the diagnosis here? Olive mass, right? Valeric stenosis. What abnormality happens in the uh, metabolic system there? not intersusception, uh, olive shaped mass, you see in paloric stenosis. What do you see there? Hypokalemia, what else? What else? What else? Hypocholeremic hypokalemia. So two things for you to remember. Number one, paralytic ileus. Number two, paloric stenosis. You see, you compare things. When you compare things, you remember things. All right. What is the single most appropriate investigation? 71, 
history of pausin yes metabolic alkalosis very right okay it's, see there is vomiting we told you yesterday that if a person's vomiting it's natural that they're going to use they're going to lose the uh, hydrogen ions so definitely they're going to have alkalosis right when you're vomiting when you're having diarrhea when you're losing these things your ions you're going to have what you're going to have metabolic alkalosis next question with a single most appropriate investigation she's hemodynamically st uh, stable she's got tenderness around the left iliac fossa abdominal tenderness and she's got large large ball obstruction with center central uh, abdominal tenderness what is the diagnosis what's the diagnosis 71 year old passing brown colored urine abdominal distension brown colored urine abdominal distension what do you think this is brown colored urine you see that is alarming is it normal to have brown colored urine especially the first too old right you're saying it's called rectal carcinoma what do you want want her to go through what's the most appropriate investigation you guys are seeing flexible sigmoidoscopy should i lock that in should i say yes for that flexible sigmoidoscopy is incorrect why they're saying most appropriate if you have a CT, why go for sigmoidoscopy? See, this is what? This is what? This is diverticular disease of the sigmoid colon, right? How? She's 71. She's 71. She's got brown colored urine, abdominal distension, large ball obstruction, right? With central abdominal tenderness. Tenderness around the left leg fossa. She's hemodynamically stable, right? Here's the thing. If this was CA, she'd just have wake symptoms, you know, bloating, maybe, you know, this brown colored urine, you know, uh, and uh, she, she'd be old and, you know, maybe she's going to be anemic, right? Wake symptoms. Cancer doesn't come on with, uh, you know, uh, with bands, all right? It doesn't come with its music system. It doesn't come announcing. It's always sinister. It's always insidious, right? It's insidious. So this is alarming, no? She's got large wall obstruction. You guys agree with me, don't you, right? Cancer is sinister in a way that's always almost insidious, right? She's got central abdominal tenderness. Okay, she's got left leg fossa features. So this is left leg fossa, right? Diverticular disease, all right? Diverticular disease of the sigmoid colon. Uh, you'd also see this in advanced tumor, advanced tumor. So CT scan is something that we're going to do because we're just trying to find out if there is an abscess as well. You guys agree? Do you guys understand what happened here? Do you guys follow? Right? Okay, left ilic fossa, or left ilic fossa would be where the problem is. What are the complications of this? You could have a perforation, right? Anything ever in the abdomen goes wrong. Think of perforation. Why? Because your abdomen is a Pandora box, right? What do you mean by Pandora box? Meaning you open one thin, the other thing come, comes out. I don't know if you guys have got your surgical rotations, but if you were there, you would notice that, you know, you just open one ball loop, it just keeps on coming, it keeps on coming, it keeps on coming. It's it's such a huge thing. And it's so fragile that if any infection happens, we're almost always afraid of hemorrhage and perforation. The rest of the things are right, fine. Hemorrhage, perforation, infection, hemorrhage, perforation, infection. You got to think of it all the time when you're dealing with abdominal problems. And colonoscopy initially, but the best thing is a CT, right? The best thing is a CT with a contrast, right? Okay, so you could have pericolinic abscess, pelvic abscess, fecal peritonitis, you know what you're going to do. What do you do in surgery? What do you do in surgery? If it, what's the basic treatment in surgery? Fluids, stabilize, give antibiotics, right? Maybe do the suction, do the NG tube in. Isn't it so? I think so, no? Okay. I hope you guys are following and can hear me. Can you guys hear me? Hi, Dr. Zareen, how are you doing? Hopefully you're doing awesome. Okay. All right, next question, next question. What is, mashallah, that's awesome. I'm doing it okay as well, just the throat isn't working. So let's just move to the next question, Dr. Zareen. Thank you for asking, by the way. We've done around five questions, don't worry, you're gonna get the recording. So we're just moving forward. What is the single most appropriate drug of choice for this treatment? Guys, look alive, all right? Okay, it's gonna be fine. Please keep going. I hope you guys are following. I need answers. I need you to be active, right? I need you to be active. 
So what is the drug of choice for her for his treatment? This is 65. He's come to the urology clinic and he's saying that, you know, he's have to wake up three times at a night and he's having weak urine stream. His PSA is 4.5. What is a normal PSA in 65 year old gentleman? What is a normal PSA in a 65 year old gentleman? What is a normal PSA in a 65 year old gentleman? Less than three, less than four. Okay. <clears throat> now we have to start with finasteride because this person's having what? This person's having what? BPH, no, he's having BPH, right? So in order to make it better, we're gonna give him tamosacin, okay? Tamosacin, tamosacin. Now this is important, which is gonna go through it. And once we're done, we won't have to look at it again and again, right? So the person would come in with, now, can you tell me three diseases that are common in black people? I'm not being racist, I mean Africans. Three diseases that we've learned so far. One from cardiology, one from pediatrics, uh, one from gynecology, fibroids, all right? Fibroid, oh, everybody remembers fibroids. What else? Bladder cancer, sickle cell anemia, what else? C of prostate, prostate CA, okay. Uh, prostate cancer, all right. What else? Placental problems, which placenta? Placental abruption, right? Placental abruption, okay? So these are more, yes, hypertension uh, treatment is different. Thank you, Dr. Asma, for pointing out. So you see, black people are more prone to these things. Do, do not forget that, right? Do not forget that. Okay, it's important because you know you're going to deal with people there. Okay, so BPH, you know, you're gonna have lower urinary tract symptoms and it's gonna be obstructive, obstructive meaning you're gonna have weak flow, hesitancy, strain and, and you know, by the way, when we're doing this, we're also dealing with the urology. If you do this topic correctly, you'd be dealing with almost 40 to 50% of urology, 40 to 50% of urology, if you do this one topic correctly, right? Half of the topics for urology you've done in your gynecology, right? So half of them we're doing here. Okay, so if the person's got BPH, she's going to have lower urinary tract symptoms, weakness and intermittent urinary flow, hesitancy, strain in, empty, uh, incomplete emptying, right, storage symptoms, post-maturation, need to have dribbling. What could go wrong if there's a storage of urine, you're going to have infection, right? You're going to have infection. What happened here? I don't know what happens, right? So you're going to have infection here. You're going to have infection. If you have your dribbling of urine, if you have dribbling of urine, only you're going to have infections, right? What else would you have? What else would you have? What else can you have? What's another complication of BPH? What is another complication of BPH? Retention, obstructive uropathy, right? Infection, retention, obstructive neuropathy. Now, what do we do? We do watchful waiting, right? That's number one. If that doesn't work out, then we start with tamosacin, alpha-1 antagonist, right? Alpha-1 antagonist. The adverse effects are what? Postural hypotension. This is important to remember. Tamosacin is alpha-1 agonist. It can cause dry mouth. Fine. I don't care about it. Postural hypotension, right? Because a person with dry mouth would not come. A person with depression would not come. A person with dizziness might not come. A person with postural hypotension will definitely present. Flap one, flap two, any anytime you're working in the accident emergency, they're taking your tamosacin, alpha cysin, uh, alpha-1 antagonist. They're going to have you know, uh, postural hypertension. Then there's alpha-1 reduct, alpha-5-alpha reductase inhibitors, which is finished right. 5 alpha um, reductase inhibitor, which is finished, right? Right. What it does is it's going to block the testosterone to be converting into dihydrotestosterone, which induces the BPH, right? What would it do? It is going to decrease the volume, right? It would decrease the volume of this prostate, and that way it will reduce these symptoms. It will reduce the progression, and this can be done before surgery of a heavy prostate, right? Uh, for at least, uh, you know, so that we can give it. And another thing about this, this finasteride, please understand and remember, is that it takes time to work, right? It is definitely good, but it takes around six months to work, right? It takes around six months to work. And one more important thing is that it can cause erectile dysfunction, right? 
Education problems, gynecomestia, do not forget these. I'm going to point them out again. I hope you guys are following and listen. What happens? I don't know what happens here. Right, so what I was saying is that with alpha one, uh, alpha uh, and gonus, you have a problem of postural hypotension. With your finasteride, you have good, good potency of you know, reducing uh, the features of the prosthetic problems, but also along with that, it's gonna take six months to improve the symptoms, but it can cause erectile dysfunction, reduced libido, ejaculation problems, can it But right? why am I spending time here? Because it's important, right? We're gonna have lots of questions for it. Lots and lots of questions, be it, or be it your urology, or lots of questions for this, right? Maybe you'd have one or two on your exam, maybe. Because it's a boring topic, they usually don't bring it up, but they might. Okay, this is for you. So what do you want to do? What do you want to do? What do you want to do? When we do this, we'd also be, you know, learning a little bit about the analgesia. So this person has what? This person is, you know... Uh, 48, they've got severe right-sided loin pain. It comes in waves for the past three hours and it has now become unbearable, right? It's now become unbearable. What would you give him? What would you give him? It's a simple question, by the way. 48, comes in wane, waves, loin pain, right-sided loin pain. What do you want to give him? Taclofenic, right? You guys use it all the time in your surgeries and your emergencies. And you also use it all the time, you know, uh, in any of the medicine setups. So diclo, diclofenic, right? This is your acute, acute abdomen because of the renal colic, right? Intramuscular diclofenic. I hope I don't have to talk much for now because, you know, this is almost the same. Okay, now this is important, right? I'll just give you 30 seconds to read it and then we'll kind of discuss it so that you can remember these things, right? Okay, you guys are saying three left hemicolectomy. So this person's 55. It's incorrect, right? Because you don't know this. You don't know this one. That's all right. Okay, you don't know this one. 41, 40 percent people say that. Dr. Asma said one. But this is important, right? Because you might have a question. It's unlikely, but you might have a question. 55-year-old man presents to the clinic feeling lethargic, right? He had weight loss and, you know, he had a colonoscopy, and he went for high rectosigmoid mass, right? It showed a high rectosigmoid mass, right? It showed what? It showed a high rectosigmoid mass. For high rectosigmoid mass, you go for what? Anterior resection, meaning, meaning you take out the rectum and the sigmoid colon. You take out the rectum and the sigmoid colon. You take out the rectum and the sigmoid colon, which is you know, uh, you're there for removing only the colon. Left hemicolectomy is not a valid option, right? You can't just, now Now you see, you can't do left hemicolectomy, even though you said so. This, this is high rectosigmoid. That means rectum and sigmoid are involved. If rectum and sigmoid are involved, you can't just take out the colon. You also have to take out the rectum and the sigmoid, right? Even though this is kind of something that we don't use. So we're going to go for anterior approach, which is abdominal wall approach. And you're going to remove this mass by anterior resection. So we have to do a little bit of it, right? Is there a screening for colorectal cancer? In the UK, is there a screening for colorectal cancer? When, at what age? At what age? It's the third most common type of cancer in the UK. Second most cause of cancer death, right? Second most cause of cancer death, right? 
So 16 to 74 is almost correct every two years, right? Screening, here it is, here it is. Most cancers tend to develop in endometrial polyps. We have to go for screening. In the UK, the person's age is 60 to 74, right? 60 to 74, every two years. Every two, two, every two years, there's a national screening program, right? They go for it with, at, at the age of 60 to 74. So if you guys would be in the UK, right? Okay, inshallah. So when you guys are gonna be in the UK and you'd be working there, right? When you'd be working there and when you get, um, you know, uh, at the age of 60, when you become 60, when you turn 60, and if you ever go for this, please do remember me. I know it's a weird, weird thing, okay? It's a weird thing to say, but I hope you'll remember it, right? 60 to 74 years of age, that's when we go for a screening uh, every two years, right? And do they do the, I guess they provide the kits, right? Home-based kits, fecal immunoglobal, immunochemical test for adults, right? They provide the kits. So um, you can go for colonoscopy, 10 scan process, food, alcohol, et cetera, all right? Okay, flexible sigmoidoscopy, barium enema, CD colonoscopy, tumor marker, you know, CEA. Now, um, how, do we, how do we treat it, right? How do we treat it? Okay, so uh, it could be colonic, colonic cancer, it could be rectal cancer, depending on what is happening. So the procedures here are important, right? Just a little, just a little, not much. So, yes, upper to third. Okay, good. All right, write it for yourself, as Dr. Berman is doing, as I told you in the beginning. So, first, you need to know that if the if the, if the cancer is at anal verge, right? If the site of the cancer is at anal verge, then there is no anastomosis. That's first thing, right? That's first thing. If the site of the cancer is at low like low rectum. Maybe a stoma, maybe, right? Plus minus a stoma, maybe, not necessarily, maybe a stoma, maybe, okay? Then, then the next thing for you to know is if the problem is at upper rectum, right? Upper rectum, anterior resection as the case was here. But if along with rectum, you have sigmoid colon involved, then it's gonna be higher anterior resection. Please understand this. Right, I know it's difficult to remember, right? You have to understand. Anal verge, no anastomosis. Low rectum, colorectal stoma, maybe, right? Upper rectum, anterior section, okay? Sigmoid colon, high anterior section. Distal transfers, descending colon, left hemicolectomy, because that is on the left side, right? The rest of the colon, right hemicolectomy. With the ileocolic anastomosis, the rest of the anastomosis are colocolon. All right, guys, I'm hoping you understood and followed. We're going to the next question. Are you guys following me? Yes, it was high rectal sigmoid, right? High rectal sigmoid, because sigmoid was also involved. See, for sigmoid, you're going to do anterior, right? Uh, for, for rectum, you're going to do anterior, but sigmoid was involved, so anterior high resection. Next question. This is for you. This is so important. And if you know the answer, you've got to tell me. Um, okay, how, how, how long, how, how, what do you mean by recent? What does recent mean here? What does recent mean here? What does it mean by recent? Six months, right? Let's see if that's true. No worries, Dr. Pachin. Okay, next question. This is again for you. Please read the scenario, okay? Initial resuscitation. You wanna go for fresh frozen plasma. Let's see if that's true. That's right. 
Okay, that's right. I'm gonna go for fresh frozen plasma. We, we, we did this, right? When we were previously, I guess, doing cardiology, we did do that, right? We did do the IR thingy. Uh, when should you stop the warfarin? When should you, when, when, when would you be told just the doses and not stop the warfarin? Do you guys remember at what INR do you hold the dosage? Anyone remembers? We've done the well score, haven't we? 2.3, that's too specific. Dr. Berwin says less than five. Guys, please remember that. Please remember that. It's gonna be helpful in respiratory, cardiology, neurology, right? Please remember that. Okay, next question. That's all right if you don't remember, but this is for you, right? I've, I've discussed this like lots of time. So if you don't remember it, it's on you. Okay, these, these things are on you. When we were doing neurology, you guys were so scared. You need, need not to be scared about the things you don't know, but you need to be scared about the things that you know when you forget, all right? Okay, so what's the most appropriate investigation? Right, let's just read the uh, investigations first. The creatinine is 4.49. Urea is nine, CRP is 49, white cell is raised, 45 year old, she has a temperature of 38, she's got distension of the abdomen, sluggish ball sounds. What investigation would you go for? She's got a persistent ileus. Can you guys read the question properly? Severe, she, uh, she went for sulpendectomy, bilateral sulpendectomy six days ago. She has severe right flank pain. And she's got a persistent ileus, distended abdomen, suckish ball sounds, temperature 38. What is the investigation you'd go for? <laughs> Abdominal x ray or CT with. Contrast. IV urography, oval, oval obstruction. Read the scenario. This is on you. Uretic injury during surgery. So what do you want to do here? CT with contrast or IVU? If you're saying it's uretric surgery or renal ultrasound. See guys, if you have a choice to do CT, being a junior doctor, first of all, you wouldn't be allowed. But if you have a choice, try and pick that, right? Try and pick that. And not here specifically, just saying, just saying, don't go for ultrasound. Ultrasound's boring. If you have a choice of CT and they say appropriate, go for that. IVU no longer used in the UK. Okay, so you guys are saying CT. Let's see. You guys are saying I didn't do that, right? You, you guys chose it. Incorrect. Renal ultrasound is right here, right? Okay, I'm here to do what? Here to do what? See, 37% people say X-ray. 20% people say CT. UV, IVU, you guys said it is obsolete in the UK. It's uretric injury. You guys said it yourself. Dr. Sadi was saying all the time. I guess she said it earlier that you know this was a uretric injury, right? It was a uretric injury. I do see that at the back of this, Dr. Butchen has also said it's a uretric injury. Uh, but who said ultrasound? I guess some of you, somebody did say ultrasound. Dr. Sadia said ultrasound, right? She did say ultrasound. Right? So, and she didn't go back on it, which is a good thing, which is a good thing, right? She's got a uretric injury. And what do you want to do here? Ultrasound. Even though I said that, you know, as a junior doctor, pick CT, right? But that's stupid at times, right? Don't just think because you're a junior doctor, you, you get to do the CT, right? Uh, there are times when you have to make a call. And the call here is to go for your, your ultrasound because it's easier. It's going to be appropriate. We can see everything there, right? We can also suspect, you know, uh, hydronephrosis. Everything would be noticed on the ultrasound. CT is going to get time. The intravenous contrast, contrast maybe you can use, but it's going to take time. So even then, 
the most appropriate thing is ultrasound, right? Most specific is CT maybe, but by then this person who had bilateral salpingoophorectomy, she's gonna die, right? No, 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 see, no, 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 here's the, here's the thing. This says most appropriate, right? Even if you think, see, most specific, understand the words. It says most specific, right? Then if it just said most specific, then maybe CD, ultra, CD, right? That's more specific. Most appropriate is an ultrasound because, you know, that's going to help her out immediately, right? Immediately. And we can just, you know, send her for the surgery, right? It needs immediate attention. People die from this complication. You guys remember water under the bridge? No? You know what it is? Water under the bridge? You know that? Have you ever heard of it? What does it mean? Water under the bridge. It's used for these surgeries, isn't it? Meaning the ureters are just in line with the arteries. Okay? Okay, folks? So you need to be very aware of it. You guys understand? Is everybody following me? Am I making any sense? Am I making any sense? All right, next question. What does the x-ray show? Tell me what is the x-ray show? I'm gonna zoom in a little. What does it show? Perforation, very specific. Okay, septic arthritis, aortogenic overflow, right? Guess and diaphragm, specific arthritis, aseptic arthritis. What do you want me to choose? Pneumoperitoneum? That's what you want me to choose, right? Okay. Your system, your system. See, there are two things, two ways to deal with questions where you have pictures. Either look at the picture. If you look at the picture, in around 10 seconds, you should get the diagnosis, right? Same with the CT and the ECG with the, or with the pictures that you see for skin lesions, right? Okay. If you, if you look at the picture, you should immediately get the diagnosis. That's how things work, right? In medicine, that's how things work, right? And you guys are from uh, countries like Bangladesh, Pakistan, India, right? Nepal and you know, the rest of the countries where we doctors deal with 30 to 40 uh, patients in a day. So it means we have this expertise, right? So if you cannot get the answer, right? Yeah, even then, even then, even then, because you know, this the question says, what is the X ratio, right? Even then, if you cannot get the answer from the picture within the first 15 seconds, please move on. Please move on, read the question. Don't force yourself to guess things. Don't waste your time. I'm telling you the time management here, right? That's my work. That's my basic thing here. Okay, folks, are you following? Next question, 30 seconds. This is for you guys. Let me just stabilize the screen a little. I know you hate me. This is not good. I don't want to annoy you, but it's happening. Okay, okay. Uh, the answer was pneumoperitoneum. Okay, this is for you guys. You guys have 30 seconds. Don't, be, don't hate me, okay? Look at it first and then reply for sure. You guys are saying it's adenocarcinoma. This is 59. She's lost some weight. So it's an adenocarcinoma. That's right, right? Everything points there. She's having irregular ball movements, right? I guess so, no? And uh, you feel like it's a, it's a rectal cancer, urgent colonoscopy, adenocarcinoma, or the most common. Next question, 30 seconds. Sterile selling, very right, specific, specific. What would you use to clean it? Sterile selling or saline.
did we do this earlier somewhere? By the way, this was a question that came in November 2021 exam. Not November, I guess August. This exactly came the same, almost the same. And this is why I've been recommending that we do Plabable. You guys are saying five? That is right, that is right, you guys know this, right? Almost something related to this game, right? So preparation mixed with adrenaline should not be used for minor surgery of the finger. Please do remember some of it, not all of it, right? Um, what do you wanna know here? Okay, I don't think it's here, but it is a rapid onset anesthetic. It lasts for around one hour and you know, it must never be used near extremities due to risk of ischemia right due to risk of ischemia especially for minor surgeries do not use it thirty seconds Central severe chain one hour ago, pain one hour ago, is no history of trauma, intensity increasing, he's sweating, right? And uh, blood pressure is dropping, widening of mediastinum. So this is your aortic dissection. Hopefully that is right. Okay, uh, what are the complications of aortic dissection? We, I think we've done this in cardiology. The complications are aortic incompetence and MI, right? Stroke, if there is a forward tear, unequal arm pulses, renal failure, right? So if you were to do PLAP2, you're going to do safety nate in there for MI, right? For MI. We're going to do this too, inshallah. Next question. Let's do this kind of fast because at 30, we're going to take a break for an MS for five minutes. And I really want us to end this today. Leave it alone. Surgery says, if it doesn't hurt, please don't touch it. That's the same thing about life, right? You know, we keep on doing uh, things which don't give us any outcomes. And we keep on hanging on to things which do not give us any outcomes. If it doesn't hurt, don't touch it. That's a simple rule in life. It's a simple rule for surgery. I know this is weird, uh, you know, analogy, but I hope you guys understand what I'm saying. Next question, 30 seconds. What is the most likely diagnosis? Absent corneal reflex, right? And protosis, okay, double vision, mesopharyngeal carcinoma. What do you think this is? Is it a migraine? Is it a cerebral metastasis? Is it optic nerve tumor? Is it posterior communication artery aneurysm? You see, what you could do here is you could do the diagnosis of exclusion thingy, and that would just make you think of four. If you forget the rest, Maybe the rest of the options would, you know, make sense to you. I hope all of you followed and answered and understood. Next question, 30 seconds. Big questions are your saviors, right? Don't, don't ever be scared of big questions. Those are your saviors.
And in big questions, you know the drill, read from below. Because you know the answer lies either below or in the first sentence. That's it, nothing in between almost. Temperature, saturation, unwell, diaphoretic, right? She's got cramp-like abdominal pain. Please read this. Please read this. Please read this. Is it charcoal triangle? Where's the pain? Where is the pain? Is it all over or just the upper quadrant? She's diaphoretic. She's vomiting. She's got nausea. Is she jaundice? She's also jaundice. She's got a temperature. Now the questionnaire is where is the pain? She's a woman. Okay, so what do you want to do? Cholangitis or cholecystitis? Or Mirzi syndrome? Okay, there is also fever. So what do you want me to choose? I'm here to choose on what you say. Write up a quadrant, right? You see, you just were about to miss it, but it says on the patient, she's sent in the right of quadrant. What do you want me to do? Cholecystitis or cholangitis? Apologize for that. So you guys are saying cholecystitis. You guys are saying cholecystitis. It's incorrect. It's cholangitis, right? It's cholangitis. Okay, this is cholangitis. Don't forget that. This is cholangitis. This is an infection of the pillory tree. Okay, no screen. Can you guys not see the screen? Apologize, I guess. Went away. This is acute cholangitis, right? Acute cholangitis. Because I told you, read from this sentence above. It's medically diagnosis, right? Up a quadrant pain, fever, right? Uh, jaundice. This is ju just right here, your cholangitis, not cholecystitis. Okay, good, Dr. Bachan. Good. I'm glad you did that. Good for you. Next question, 30 seconds. She should have some history of gallstones. And they should have been reactive in some way, some fashion, right? She must, she should have infection prior to that. Something to trigger that. Yes, what is it? Lesnoprozole, you wanna go for lesnoprozole? Four, yes, Dr. Leluxi Cray, who's that? You're raising your hand, are you saying something? Or was it by mistake? Okay, you guys want me to do what? Listen, Brazil. And this is a qu new question, I guess. You know, she's got prostate cancer, the person, sorry, she can't have prostate cancer, that's kind of impossible, right? But the person's got prostate cancer, and they were prescribed, no worries, no worries, they were prescribed with, uh, with Joserolin, right? Joserolin or Goserolin, I don't know how you want to pronounce it, right? And or Goserolin, and they've got prostate cancer. Which one of the following is the most appropriate, most important to co-prescribe, right? It's anti-androgen treatment, cryptoterone, ciproteron acetate, ciproteron acetate, yeah, presented, uh, co-prescribed with, again, uh, gondarolin, uh, gonadarolin analogs because of the risk of tumor flare, right? Do you understand what I'm saying here? Here's the thing. This person's got prostate cancer, right? If this person's got a prostate cancer, what are you going to do about it? This is different. I don't, I think we've done this, but not much. The uh, management is kind of important. So here you need to remember this charge for, chart for PSA. The normal PSA value, the normal PSA value for 60 to 69 is four, right? 60 to 69 is four. More than 70 years old, five is also all right. Five is also all right, right? Five is also all right, okay? Now, what do we do? What do we do? Uh, what are the reasons? Let's read this. 
what are the reasons there might be a raised PSA, right? BPH, okay? BPH, no, it's almost the same, almost the same, just the question's kind of twisted. You'd be reading this in neurology, just a little, all right? Okay, BPH, right? Benign prosthetic hyperplasia, prostitis, urinary tract infection, B B PSA is raised. Ejaculation, PSA is raised. Vigorous exercise, PSA is raised. Urinary retention, PSA is raised. Instrumentation of the urinary tract, PSA is raised, okay? When else is PSA raised? 48 hours of ejaculation, right? Take a screenshot of this thing, okay? 48 hours of ejaculation, 48 hours of vigorous exercise, one week of DRE, four weeks of a UTI, proven UTI, six weeks of a prostate biopsy. You know, this good thing goes up and up and up, right? So two days of vigorous exercise of ejaculation, PSA would be up. So, you know, you would tell the patient that, you know, no need, uh, you, can't, you can't have sex, right? Uh, because, you know, uh, the PSA is going to go up and we can't take your PSA levels, right? This is your precaution as when you're going to be working there in PLAP 2, you know, you have to say these things. So you have to, you know, just be uh, okay with it. With, it's okay with saying such things, right? Vigorous exercise. You're going to ask them not to do exercise. You're going to ask them that if you had a DRE, you're going to inquire, did you have a DRE? Did you have a prostate biopsy? Did you have any proven UTIs, right? So you need to do this and remember this for sure. This is kind of important if you're having a person who's got prostate and this is a common problem. So kind of try and remember this thing, okay? So how do you treat it? How do you treat it? Management. First thing is conservative, which means watchful monitoring, right? Watchful monitoring, that's number one. Then you can go for radical prostectomy, radical prostectomy. Then, if there is metastasis, you can go for GNR synthetic agonist. Can you name the dopamine agonist for the restless syndrome, which is Willis Ikebom syndrome? I hope you guys are following. I know I say a lot of things in the same tone because of my voice, but I hope you guys understand what I'm saying. Ralizol, right? Ralizol, dopamine agonist for Ikebom Willis. Isn't it correct? Don't forget these names right? These are weird names, but these are important, right? So we give this initially, right? To prevent the rise of testosterone, okay? And along with that, along with that, you're going to put in intracytoplasmic protein complexes. Who is this? Okay. And along with that, you're going to go for radiotherapy. This phosphonates in conjunction with NSAIDs, right? Okay. What do you think would work first for the pain? or the calcium thingy symptoms? What, should, what do you think would work first? Radiotherapy or bisphosphonates? Palliative care, what would work first? Radiotherapy works first? What works first? No, better, what works first? Bisphosphonates are medication. Radiotherapy is a treatment. Radiation takes take time. This phosphonate. Dr. Lelux, could you tell me your real name? Or is this your real name? I hope I'm taking it correctly. Okay, next question, by the way. Uh, what's the most likely diagnosis? You guys have 30 seconds to answer this, which is a lot if you ask me. And we've done this before. We've done this before. Okay, acute limb ischemia. You guys are saying acute limb ischemia. Let's just choose the answer. Let's get it right. Next question. I'm not going to discuss this. We've done this before. This topic keeps on coming. So, you know, next question.
folks see this looks like an staghorn right have you guys seen a staghorn this is staghorn right and the next question i stop talking because i want you to do this right i want you to do this because this is something that we've done earlier right when i stop talking that means it's your mock kind of thingy okay what would you prescribe nimidopin separate my hemorrhage nimidopin should make sense Right, calcium channel blocker. Okay, next question. Next question. The timer is only 30 seconds, all right? The timer is only 30 seconds. I move the screen, the timer starts. I know the timer in my head. And you know, you have to answer within that time, okay? And, and in the future, I'm just gonna make it 20 seconds now. Because you know, 30 seconds is even a lot. You guys have done lots of questions by now. And I think you guys are pro now, okay? So from now on, it's gonna be 20 seconds. I hope you understand. And I hope that's all right. Okay, peptic ulcer perforation. Okay, because you know, time's the game. Most of the things you know, time's the game in this exam, right? Okay, what is the most appropriate investigation? 71, extremely tired. That's your first clue. And you can see the iron banding capacity being higher. She's got iron deficiency anemia, ferritin is low. What investigation do you wanna go for? Old person, being tired, right? And you know, have an iron deficiency in a male. What do you want to do? B12 and folate, colonoscopy. Most appropriate, they're asking. Fecal occult blood. Okay. See, read the question. Always read the question. The question, I mean this one. What's the most appropriate investigation? What's the most appropriate investigation? Occult blood or colonoscopy? RCA-125, CEA, right? Or a bone marrow biopsy. Why a bone marrow biopsy? Dude, it's very painful. That's what the, that's what the person would tell you. That's painful. Okay. All right. See, see, see. You guys have read the same thing. We've been doing the same thing. You guys have the same diagnosis. Almost all of you have different approaches. What does that mean? That means different people see different things differently. Sometimes the same things differently. This is the same thing. You guys think she's got cancer. You know she's having iron deficiency anemia. But almost all of you are for the same thing saying different things. What do you want me to do? Whoever replies next, I'll just choose their answer. Don't be confused. Don't be confused. So Dr. Negma said colonoscopy. Let's see if that's something we should do. That's correct, right? Read the question, that's it. You all have to do is read the question. Okay, read the question. Okay, read the question. Iron deficiency and anemia, why would you go for veto and fall it? You don't do that, okay? Next question, folks. What do you want to do? What do you want to stop? What is this person having? He's having diarrhea. Which of the following can cause, cause more diarrhea? What is capacitabin? If you're choosing it, 
Tell me what is it? You know, there's one thing that GMC says all the time and forget GMC, everybody says that. That is, that is, that is, have a reason behind you choosing something, right? Have a reason behind you choosing something, okay? So if you're stopping this, you know, uh, chemotherapy, why are you stopping it? What is a person having? It's called liver metastasis. He's having severe diarrhea. He's having dehydration. What's the function of fluconazole? What is it? Antifungal? What is alpurinol? Antiuric acid, right? What is loperamide? What is loperamide? What does it do? What is loperamide? Antidiarrheal? Antidiarrheal. For diarrhea, causes diarrhea, or is it treatment of diarrhea? Okay, so you want me to stop loperamide? All right. Okay. That's what you said. Incorrect. When you said it's empty diarrheal, the person's having severe diarrhea. Why would you stop that? Where is your logic? You guys said yourself, Dr. Samir is right, by the way. See, see, I hope you guys are having a little bit of laugh because you know, you guys said yourself, it's empty diarrheal. The person has diarrhea. The only thing that's helping him, you're going to stop that. Why? Are you guys in, in alliance with Trump? Okay, but you guys chose to. You guys chose to. The only thing, you guys are good doctors, by the way. You stopped the only thing that helps him. That is amazing. I'm hoping that all your patients survive. Okay, and they get better, hopefully. Hopefully, okay, just kidding. Just kidding. Okay, yes, uh, this also covers your pharmacology a little, right? But you know, you can use logic. You can use logic here. Okay, see, this is, as Dr. Samir said, that this is an anti. Uh, you know, chemotherapy, like chemotherapy drug. And it is a contraindication um, to use this uh, capacitifibin, capacitibin, bad with pronunciation, with a person having dehydration and diarrhea, okay? And lipermite was helping him. Why would you stop that? You know, I'm not kidding. All of you said two, okay? I'm not kidding. All of you said two. I want to end it. But all of you said two. Just look at this, except Dr. Samir, right? Almost all of you said two. Okay. All right. Next question, 30 seconds. You guys are awesome, by the way. I'm not kidding. I mean it. But use logic, okay? What do you want to do? Simple question requires simple answer. What do you want to do? However, don't be blind. What do you want to do? 35, young patient, emergency department, have an acute pain, right? Presents in the emergency, have an acute pain, okay? Do we give benzophlomocyazide to prevent future effects or attacks? Do we do that? When? Do you do that in the hospital that you worked? Did you ever do it in your life? Even if it's the time that you know you forgot doing it, like it's been a long, long time when you, you know, did medicine. But did you ever do that? Pentaflumothiazide is, you know, antihypertensive. Why would you do that? So you're saying I am diclofenic sodium. Let's see if that's true. You guys have said it. I didn't use logic, right? You see, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Our brain is, you know. It is against us at times, right? Why? Because you know the things, but you use, you, you know, your brain on the exam day would make you say things that you wouldn't even wonder, right? In, in reality, because exam is different from the reality, right? You, you're going to be in a parallel universe, right? So you're going to make up things that you don't even think are there. So do not believe your brain. Remember the things that your heart knows, okay? So this is why they say, follow your gut when you're taking an exam, not your brain, because your brain's going to be crazy. You know the memes where the brain says, I don't remember, right? That's what the brain's going to do, okay? All right? Okay, which anesthetic agent has an inherent anti-emetic property? You guys must have done it when you were doing surgery, you know, you were learning, and all of your professors, you know, said, oh, we've got a wonder drug, because my professor did that. He said that, you know, we have a wonder drug. 
we have a wonder drug. It's an anesthetic, and all of the anesthetics love it. And it's physiology, it's not the anesthetics. Is it ketamine, ketamine or propofol? I know you're not thinking eticurium or, you know, saxomethonium. You're not thinking of sevoflurane. Which one is it? Two, into, two is a wonder drug. Okay, two is a wonder drug. Okay, but which one of the following has antimetic properties? Propofol or ketamine? The person, the patient who takes it would thank you that I don't want to be, I, I don't want to vomit, right? I, I, I won't be vomiting. Propofol or ketamine? Guys, make a call. All of you are here and none of you is replying. Google things, but I need replies. Okay. Dr. Sheila, are you there? Not ketamine. Okay. That's right. It's propofol. Okay. It's propofol. Okay. Propofol. That's right. It's propofol. Okay. Propofol. This is involved in not making you vomit. Okay. Next question. 30 seconds. Then after this, we're going to take a break of around five minutes for namaz. And we're going to come back and do this and end it. Because it's going to be almost like a mock. Because here, all the things here are the ones that you already know. You know, here you don't. If you start from the beginning, you're wasting your time. That's why I always say you read the question. The question says, what's a single most sensitive blood test for diagnosis of acute pancreatitis? If you read from the beginning, you know, you'd waste your time. Lipase. That's what you guys said. Sensitive is lipase. Right? Sensitive. There's a difference. Sensitive and specific. Okay, next question. Now here you need to remember the thing we spoke of earlier. If the problem's inside, what would you do? If the problem's outside, what would you do? And please give him something that wouldn't make him you know, uh, have more complications, right? And wouldn't put him in trouble, wouldn't require surgery, a cut. Right? Because we're trying to make sure that the patient feels better. That's our job, right? That they're pain, pain free, almost, right? So bag. And if the problem was inside the esophagus then, for example, the person had esophageal cancer, then it's dental. Okay, Stenton. Okay, let's do five more and then a break. Five more and a break, okay? Because I really want us to end this today, inshallah, hopefully. One can only dream, no? Quickly, folks, quickly. O negative, universal donut. Is there something new that we're learning? Almost not, because we've done this. And we did this too, when we were doing contraceptives, I guess, no? When would you ask it to stop the contraceptive? Two weeks or four weeks? Or eight weeks? Option three you meant, okay. That's right. And what about, what about antibiotics when it comes to your, um, your peptic ulcer? And you're sending them for, you know, urea test, urea breath test. How long would you want them to stop antibiotics before? 
I guess that's that's the question, right? How many weeks before? Is it endoscopy or is it your breath test? 28 days. Okay, you see I'm asking some things questions, but you guys are not interested or right, we'll move forward. Okay, bilateral renal artery stenosis cause the cause of hypertension in a 50 year old. No past medical history, symptom asymptomatic. Correct. Next question. You see, it came in June 2020 exam. All right, this is the last question that we're doing for now. Then we're going to take a break. When we come back, you'd be doing a mock style kind of session, okay? Unless you learn something new. You see, we just did it yesterday when we were doing emergency, didn't we? Right? I'm hoping you guys remember it. Start from option five. Amnesia of one minute, one episode of vomiting. One episode of vomiting. Initial, please, please understand that it's different for children and for adults. Initial assessment in the emergency, 60 minutes after the injury, the GC has dropped to 14. Last medical history of vomit brand disease. It's one, by the way. Patient lost consciousness for 10 seconds. See, now one minute thing is incorrect. The option where it says around 60 minutes after injury, incorrect, I guess. Warm for the brain disease, incorrect. 10 second thingy, incorrect. So again, with the diagnosis of exclusion thingy, you know, or the exclusion of option, you go with one episode of vomiting, which is incorrect, which is incorrect. You know, I think almost a lot of people would have chose one episode of vomiting, but that's incorrect. I told you, I told you, this person's been adult, right? With one episode of vomiting, you're just going to make them, you know, go for a CT scan. Then every time a person comes in with head injury, you'd be doing lots of CTs. They're going to say, you know, go back to your home. Go back to your home country. Why? And, and you know, not even your home country, not even your home country. Here's the thing. More than one episode, not one episode. More than three in children. More than three in children. Okay, more than three in children. We kick them out. It's your turn to kick us out from their country because we're trying to get in, right? I know this is on the record. I should, I should shut it down for a minute. Okay, all right, next question. Next question. We're gonna do the next question in five minutes, okay? I, I, I know I make lame jokes, but I'm hoping that you guys understand. Okay, so we're gonna take a break of five minutes. We're gonna come back um, and we're gonna do the rest of it as a mock. Discussing CD head after trauma. Okay. What does that mean? 